After its initial release on the Famicom in 1987, Final Fantasy continued to grow in stature as Square forged a close-knit relationship with Nintendo. That relationship peaked upon the release of Final Fantasy VI as it became the highest rated and highest grossing game in the history of the franchise. But after Square chose to abandon Nintendo, changing their allegiance to Sony, the franchise broke new ground and became nothing short of a global sensation. Even though Final Fantasy I, IV and VI had been released in North America, none of them had performed all that well, and Final Fantasy VI was considered a disappointment after posting sales that were only marginally better than Mystic Quest. It meant expectations were quite low ahead of the Western release of Final Fantasy VII, especially as the PlayStation was struggling to gain a foothold and Japanese RPGs were still considered quite niche. But with localization being taken more seriously, and with Sony offering a significant amount of support for marketing, Final Fantasy VII smashed its internal target of selling 1 million copies outside of Japan, and its follow-up, Final Fantasy VIII, which released a few years later, performed just as well, proving the appetite for Final Fantasy was real, not just amongst Japanese gamers, but also gamers across North America and Europe. Such performance was down to a huge team effort, but Yoshinori Kitaze, who had stepped up to fill the pretty big directorial shoes of Hironobu Sakaguchi, was the man who brought everyone together to create two games that are now considered to be some of the best of all time. When thoughts then moved towards how Final Fantasy would appear on the next generation of PlayStation hardware, Sakaguchi felt Kitaze would be the perfect man to lead the charge, and this decision would lead to the creation of a game that not only deviated from established norms, but would build such a comprehensive and developed world that the creative minds at Square would be encouraged to do something they had never done before, continue a story beyond its conclusion. This is the history of Final Fantasy X. When Final Fantasy X released in 2001, it received near-universal acclaim for its powerful storyline, compelling characters, and world-class presentation, which featured awe-inspiring full-motion video sequences, voice acting, and yet another high-quality soundtrack. There was also a significant amount of respect for how Yoshinori Kitaze had once again managed to accomplish the difficult task of navigating Final Fantasy from one console generation to the next while simultaneously reimagining the franchise, but still managing to keep it faithful to the many games that had come before. But what's interesting is that when development of Final Fantasy X began in 1999, the initial intention was not for the game to be the next major installment into the Final Fantasy franchise. At the time, there was an appreciation at Square that even though Final Fantasy was their flagship franchise, and it retained a high degree of importance for the company, that there also needed to be a steady pipeline of new properties being developed. This would help to decrease the reliance of the next big Final Fantasy game to sustain the company's forward momentum. But the challenge was that as Square had developed, so too had its reputation within the video games industry. This led to a high degree of expectation for any property developed or published by Square, Final Fantasy or otherwise, but each of the creative teams stepped up to the challenge, creating games like Chrono Trigger, Super Mario RPG, Parasite Eve and Vagrant Story, and creating lasting legacies. Final Fantasy IX could have also been part of this list, as it too started off as a separate initiative not explicitly tied to the Final Fantasy franchise. But partway through development, the decision was taken to rebrand it as a mainline Final Fantasy game, and this represented something of a watershed moment for the franchise. Up until that point, development of every major game had always been overseen by the same core team, and work would only start after the previous game had shipped and senior staff members had returned from their well-earned recuperation periods. Even though the franchise had undergone significant evolution by using that approach, as new figures had brought fresh ideas when joining the company, and venerable figures were promoted into senior roles where they could better put forth their ideas, Sakaguchi, who was now well established in his role as vice president of the company, felt like this approach could lead to the franchise becoming stale. When Final Fantasy IX became Final Fantasy IX, it meant a wholly different senior team had been assigned. Hiroyuki Ito would serve as director, and Sakaguchi himself would return to act as producer, having vacated that role in Final Fantasy VIII. And amongst the senior staff, there were very few individuals who worked on both Final Fantasy VIII and Final Fantasy IX. It meant that when Final Fantasy VIII shipped, 
due to there being no immediate requirement for them to work on the next major Final Fantasy game, as it was already taken care of, Kitase must have felt like he actually had a bit of room to explore some new ideas and experiment without the typical constraints that would normally be associated with working on such a big franchise. This freedom led to the creation of a project known as Seventeen. Katase envisioned a world that had been ravaged by a plague that was ending the lives of people when they turned 17 years old. Its story would revolve around two characters who, having learnt the truth about the plague and its origins, would embark on a quest to try and find a cure. It's believed those two characters were who would later become known as Tidus and Yuna, as outside of there being clear similarities with the protagonists that appeared in the 17 concept art amongst the final cast, they were the only two characters who are 17 years of age. One of the main themes that spurred Kitase to create this narrative was the notion of inevitable death. The plague was meant to represent that notion, as numerous people around the world could do nothing but accept that there was a chance their lives would end when they reached a certain milestone. Even though Tedious would have played an important role, the role of Yuna would have been of equal importance, but their lives were planned to be juxtaposed to one another. Whereas Yuna was planned to be a healer, associated with a benevolent organisation that was created to try and tend to those who were affected by the plague, Tidus was meant to be a delinquent who was angry at life and worked as a plumber. As the team started to develop the narrative, the writers realised that it would be hard to root for someone whose main trait was anger. As such, they chose to make Tidus more aspirational as a character, even changing his vocation from plumbing to sports. They also chose to adjust how the plague would manifest, with Sin being written as a softer interpretation of the shared tragedy that would befall the citizens. Instead of affecting people when they turned 17, it was instead aligned with faith and it became a shared tragedy that could affect a significant portion of the population irrespective of age. This change saw the notion of inevitable death carried over to Yuna, as upon the conclusion of her pilgrimage her life was planned to come to an end and it was a fate that almost everyone in Spira knew would befall those who chose to walk that certain path. That path also ended up becoming a narrative theme on its own, and it served as just one example of how much more detailed and multifaceted the narrative was planned to be in comparison to any of the games previously released in the franchise. In prior experiences, the journey taken by the party to achieve their goals was often an afterthought. Our heroes would follow the trail laid out before them, but it was always reactive as opposed to predetermined. In this new game, the journey itself would be elevated into a more prominent position, with specific attention placed to where the party was on the map, as well as plotting progress. It was even given a name, the pilgrimage, and time was taken to explore the importance of each location through dialogue that often revealed important historical context. Connectivity was also of the utmost importance, and this is something we have delved into numerous times before in our Parallel series. Very few characters appear in the world to just make up the numbers, and it made it feel much more lived in. They were instead given purpose and connections to the world around them, with even small characters like Father Zook who appeared to provide a warning about the perilous path the party had chosen to walk but he was also used to divulge important details that not only showed a connection to Lulu, but also helped to expand her backstory, providing a look behind the curtain of her often calm and collected demeanour. Within this rather wide narrative theme, family was the most important aspect of connectivity that the writers wanted to explore. As with the journey, in many of the earlier games, it was rare for any part of the narrative to be used to explore familial ties the protagonists had. Many of the main protagonists were positioned as orphans, and the wider cast would use parental figures, at best, as plot devices. Final Fantasy IV did make some strides to move away from this, with Cecil's father and heritage explored, albeit loosely, but Rosa and Kane were more typical, and Edge's parents were used as a device to motivate and explain his behaviour. When Katase joined production on Final Fantasy V, this was one area that saw a noticeable change, and it carried over to Final Fantasy VI. There was a clear attempt to create concrete backstories for the parents of protagonists, and to establish connections between characters and how much those connections meant. Bartz, Lena and Faris each had parents who made an active contribution to the story, and we also got to learn about Terra's parents. Kataze, who was responsible for the story of Gao, even wrote in a small quest about searching for his father, and there were plans to explore the relationship between Shadow and Realm with more depth, but they were unfortunately cut from the final game.
when work started on Final Fantasy VII, Kitaze wanted to take these notions further and an earlier draft of the story showed that there was going to be a focus around a father and his son. But many of these concepts did not make the final draft and there ended up being a much smaller focus around family, as shown through the eyes of Barrett and Marlene, as well as Godo and Yuffie. When development wrapped on Final Fantasy VII, Katazi himself had become a father, and some of the narrative concepts he proposed for that game ended up being explored in Final Fantasy VIII through the eyes of Squall and Naguna, as well as Renoa and her father, Fury Carraway. But it wasn't until Final Fantasy X that Katazi felt the time was right to have a specific focus on family, and it would be very comprehensive, having multiple layers of depth. On the surface would be an exploration of the relationships that existed between father and son, as denoted by Tidus and Jekt, and father and daughter, as denoted by not just Yuna and Braska, but also Riku and Sid. Each was planned to show a different kind of dynamic. Even though in each instance the father was an important influence on the child, the nature of that influence varied. Tidus was struggling to overcome the negative influence of his father, while Yuna was buoyed by the positive influence of her father. Riku, being the only one of the three who still had her father alive, also highlighted another dynamic, as they often butted heads, but still had a deep respect for each other. Seymour was also a fascinating addition, as he was used to explore how influence and choices made by both parents could have a profound and devastating effect on a child. The writers were also keen to explore family in a much wider sense, with Oren being used to represent the role of a surrogate father, and Kamari that of a guardian. Waka and Lulu were then used as Yuna's protectors, but also acting as adoptive siblings. Such was the depth of the experience and the relationships that ended up being created between all the characters that it even led to Katase shedding tears throughout development as they had created such a meaningful cast of characters who, for the most part, weren't just pulled together through random circumstance. They were in this together, and many had known each other for years. Alongside these two main themes, in his role as co-director, Motomo Toriyama introduced another, overriding theme that would drive not just the story, but would also serve as a mantra for development as a whole, and that theme was independence. He wanted the theme to be present in numerous ways, independence from parents, independence from society, and independence from religion. They made the heart of the story about breaking away from each of these areas to make someone free to live their own life. But such was the power of the theme that the development team themselves embodied the notion. Even though Final Fantasy VII and VIII had been a roaring success, they weren't without criticism. Feedback was received from some of the older fans who had grown up playing Final Fantasy I through VI that the genre of the narrative had changed too much. They preferred simple fantasy worlds that were rooted in traditional medieval settings as opposed to the more futuristic vibe. It was feedback that resonated with the development team, and they vowed to have Final Fantasy X revert back to being based in a medieval themed world, but after doing some initial planning work, they just felt uninspired by that choice. But they also knew that they didn't want to create another futuristic game, and it led to something of a quandary. The team therefore decided that it would perhaps be best to challenge the established notions of high fantasy itself by deviating away from the expected medieval setting and creating a brand new fantasy that would be based around traditional Asian elements. To make sure players would not be disappointed by their decision, the team vowed to make the world of Final Fantasy X, which became known as Spira, the most finely detailed world they had ever created, and they used Okinawa as a primary source of inspiration. This became the basis for a lot of creative decisions, and was a direct source of inspiration for many of these southerly isles on the world map, with the team also visiting and gaining inspiration from Thailand and other areas of the South Pacific. Other parts of the world were also inspired by real-life locations, such as Zanakand and Bavel, the latter of which was inspired by, by Balinese shrines that exist throughout Indonesia. It was also made clear from the beginning that this world needed to be realistic. Throughout the PlayStation 1 era, the team had placed heavy reliance on pre-rendered backgrounds that would need to be crafted so that they would feel like part of the world. Final Fantasy X would deviate by having fully realised 3D environments, something that would be known as the active field system. This initiative was overseen by Takeyoshi Nakazato, who was the map director, and Yosuke Nayora, the game's art director, who had a specific focus on the game's world. They envisioned a game where players would have complete freedom of movement, able to look around the world however they pleased. They wanted players to feel like they were part of the world, and by creating 3D environments, they could employ physics-based interactions with the characters, by showing how wind affected the characters' hair and clothing, but also the grass they were standing on. 
Nakazato also felt like this would make the world map quite redundant, as it wasn't realistic. Instead, he wanted each location to flow, so that when you left a town and went into the field, there would be no visible disconnect. The battle system was also designed to work with that objective. With Ito working as the director on Final Fantasy IX, Square were forced to look elsewhere for someone who could oversee the battle system. Ito had been heavily involved with almost every battle system from Final Fantasy 1 through 9, and it meant that there were some pretty big shoes to fill. But having created the Front Mission franchise, which was known for its intricate and methodical gameplay systems, Square must have been confident that Toshiro Tsuchida would be up to the task. Having never worked on the franchise before, Tsuchida was initially keen to build upon the ATB system that had been created and iterated on over the previous five games. But sticking with the theme of being independent, after going through the initial research phase, Tsuchida felt uninspired and decided to move away from the ATB system to create something much more dynamic. Tsuchida envisioned a gameplay system where enemies would be visible on the field map. This would then lead to seamless integration with the actual battle sequences, and they even planned to have it so that the character could move around during encounters. At some point towards the second half of 1999, 17 became Final Fantasy X, and it was announced as such during the Square Millennium event. Many of the aforementioned concepts were present, such as the free-flowing camera and the interactive environments. Alongside these groundbreaking feats of technology, it was also announced that Final Fantasy X would be the first game in the franchise to take advantage of Play Online, a brand new initiative that Square hoped would change the way players around the world would connect with the brand and interact with one another to play together. This would allow for a strategy guide to be inserted directly into the game. Assuming players had a network adapter, they would be able to gain information about locations they were visiting as well as what to do next, and Square believed this would be a game changer. The game was scheduled to come out towards the start of 2001, a year after its announcement, and it would arrive as not only a quick follow-up to Final Fantasy IX, but also as a statement of intent for Square's aspirations on the PlayStation 2. But after the game had been revealed, the team encountered numerous problems, and almost every aspect of the game was impacted. Having become known for their graphical prowess, Square were ambitious as to what they felt was achievable with this new, more powerful hardware. But in its infancy, it was notoriously difficult to unlock the potential housed within the PlayStation 2 due to how its architecture had been set up, and almost everything needed to be scaled back. Environments reverted back to static cameras that would follow the player, as opposed to being under the player's control, and enemies were removed from the field, with random battles reintroduced, as well as the separate battle scene that had been with the franchise since the beginning. As noted by Takashi Katano, who is one of the game's main programmers, one of the challenges was their struggle to figure out how to change the controls between field and battle, but ultimately, they just couldn't push the PlayStation 2 as much as they wanted. It meant Tsuchida was forced to create the conditional turn-based battle system, which he believed, given the new constraints, would give the game a much more strategic feel. Square were also forced to dial back their lofty ambitions for Dolby Digital. Final Fantasy VIII and IX had featured surround sound for FMV sequences, and Square were forced to settle for the same implementation again, as opposed to their initial plan, which was to go forward and have surround sound being used for all aspects of the game. Huge rewrites were also required for the story. Tidus, for example, had to have a specific story element moved over to Oren as the writers felt it would be too similar to The Sixth Sense, a film that had released towards the end of 1999 in Japan, and around halfway through development, the decision was taken to scrap and redo every playable character except for Tidus and Yuna. Play Online was also delayed, something that required changes to the game's menu systems and integrations, and there were also issues with how the soundtrack would be composed, something that created a unique arrangement. Uematsu had initially thought about leaving the video games industry after the completion of Final Fantasy V, but after working on Final Fantasy VI and then Gun Hazard, a spin-off from the Front Mission franchise, he gained a second wind as he realised there was still so much he could learn. Final Fantasy VII and VIII benefited from this new wave of inspiration, but it was Final Fantasy IX where Uematsu dived in headfirst, creating almost six hours worth of music. With Final Fantasy X releasing so soon after Final Fantasy IX, Uematsu decided he would need help, as there was too much work to do in too little time. Having worked with Masashi Hamwazu and Jinja Nakano on Gun Hazard, Uematsu knew that they were able to compose in styles that complemented his own, and so they were assigned to specific tracks to work on. 
Uematsu was then able to spend his time focusing on exploring the melodies that would permeate throughout Final Fantasy X, and this was something that was heavily influenced by the addition of voice acting, as the music would need to adapt to not just what was being said, but how it was being said. When thinking about the shift between console generations, outside of increasing the scale and quality of everything, Gitarzi was adamant that voice acting would need to feature. It would allow for a greater depth of expression, not just through sound, but the character models were also enhanced to allow for facial expressions and their lips would need to move in alignment with the speech of the actors. This too led to changes with the script, as upon hearing an actor say certain lines, the writers just felt it didn't land how they had anticipated, and this was the case in both the Japanese and English version of the game, with perhaps the most noticeable shift being Yuna saying I love you at the end of the game, as opposed to the original line which was thank you. Care was also taken to select the appropriate voice talent. Due to their cinematic ambitions, Square realised it was important to have big names associated with projects to garner interest. It saw them cast the likes of Alec Baldwin, Perry Gilpin and Donald Sutherland for The Spirits Within, and they had planned to take a similar approach on Final Fantasy X, with two big name celebrities cast as Tidus and Yuna. But after much deliberation, Square decided to take the opposite approach, as they wanted the focus to be on the story itself, as opposed to the actors who were playing the parts. They therefore chose to cast lesser known actors like James Arnold Taylor and Hedy Burris, who would then become associated with the characters as opposed to the characters being associated with the actors. As development continued, and with numerous changes and issues throughout, Square chose to delay Final Fantasy X and even though it enabled them to add two new summons, more limit attacks and fine tune the voice work, it was not a favourable decision. No Final Fantasy game had ever been publicly delayed before, and any delay meant that as Final Fantasy X was planned to release in Q1 of 2001, its revenue would not be seen until the next financial year. And with the company under a lot of pressure due to the colossal financial failure that was the spirits within, it made everything rather tense. The next question though was, well, when should it be delayed until? And the answer came by working hand in hand with Sony, as the decision was taken to move the game to July, so that Final Fantasy X would appear as direct competition to the GameCube, which was initially planned to release in July. By the end of development, Final Fantasy X had cost approximately 4 billion yen, or around 32 million dollars. Less than the cost of Final Fantasy VII and IX, but more than the cost of Final Fantasy VIII, and to those involved, it was clear that they had developed something pretty special. But Square were apprehensive about performance. Due to the low install base of the PlayStation 2, they were keen to downplay expectations and were targeting 5.6 to 6.8 million copies globally, a few million less than both Final Fantasy 7 and 8. But as they got closer to launch, Hisashi Suzuki revealed that they not only expected Final Fantasy X to surpass the sales of Final Fantasy VII in Japan, they also expected it to become the best-selling game in the franchise. That renewed confidence was justified within a few days of the Japanese launch. Famitsu scored Final Fantasy X as a 39 out of 40, the best score ever received by a Final Fantasy game, and it became only the 10th game in the history of Famitsu to receive a 39 or above. Sales matched with 1.5 million gamers pre-ordering Final Fantasy X and another 400,000 purchasing the game within the first four days of release. It soon became the first PlayStation 2 game to sell 2 million copies, and when it launched in North America the week before Christmas that same year, the demand was just as intense. Final Fantasy X was designated by almost everyone within the industry as a must-have game for PlayStation 2 owners, and it not only broke pre-order records, but became the fastest selling PlayStation 2 game in that region. Yoshinori Kitase had done it again. What started out as nothing more than an idea, not even connected with Final Fantasy, had been moulded through blood, sweat and tears to create something that in the end felt very Final Fantasy. But it wasn't just that. Final Fantasy X had redefined what it meant to be a Final Fantasy game, and from the outside it had been achieved with consummate ease. Those who were familiar with the franchise expected there to be a new protagonist, a new world and new gameplay mechanics, but Final Fantasy X went so far beyond that. Gameplay wasn't just tweaked, it was reimagined through a new combat system, and it was joined by a new progression system called the Sphere Grid. Progression was then complemented by weapon crafting, and by allowing players to switch characters during battles, party members were less likely to be forgotten. Voice acting then arrived as a game changer, and the improvement to in-game and pre-rendered visuals was mind-blowing. With there also being no world map, and with Uematsu no longer serving as the sole composer, despite there being no noticeable drop in quality, 
it made Final Fantasy X a very memorable and enduring experience, and this was true for players around the world, as well as the creators themselves. Up until that point, it had always been very clear that each Final Fantasy game was a self-contained experience. Once the story ended, focus would move on to the next new story, and the rest was left to the imagination. But Final Fantasy X was different. The creators just couldn't let it go in the same way they had before. And that unwillingness to let the story go led to the creation of Final Fantasy X Eternal Calm, a small expansion to the story that was released alongside Final Fantasy X International. The developers wanted to produce it as nothing more than a love letter to the fans, but it ended up becoming so much more after they saw how positive fans were in response to its inclusion. That positive response spurred the team on to do something they had never done before, create a full-fledged sequel to a Final Fantasy experience, and it became known as Final Fantasy X-2. But instead of just iterating on the original, retaining the majority of elements and refining them, with Motomo Toriyama installed as director in place of Yoshinori Kitase, the decision was taken to continue the story, but treat everything else as they would a new mainline game in the series. It led to wholesale changes being made, and although some were positive, there were also some that left a sour taste for those who were expecting more of the same and got something very different. Nonetheless, even though its legacy has received mixed reviews, and that sentiment still lingers with continued talk about the prospect of Final Fantasy X 3, nothing can take away from what was accomplished by the original game when it released 20 years ago. It still stands as one of the best games ever made, and also as the final chapter of the Katase era, which in seven short years had delivered Final Fantasy VI, VII, VIII, and X, four of the greatest games to have ever existed. Many of you who have watched our channel over the years will know how much Final Fantasy X means to us, not just as fans, but also as creators. I can't even count how many times Lauren and I have played through the game, and each time we do, we find something new and exciting that we can't wait to discuss with each other and share with all of you. As it's the 20th anniversary of Final Fantasy X, we wanted to do something special, and we hope this video helps you to reminisce and enjoy certain aspects of the game and the unique story behind its creation. Be sure to let us know in the comments below what Final Fantasy X means to you, and make sure to subscribe if you're new to the channel as we have some awesome videos coming up in the next few weeks. Alright guys, with that, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Raining Eckham, Benjamin Snow and Gregory, who are super special Onion Knight supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.